All right, everybody, what's going on? Welcome back to TCP for episode 58. Excited to get this one underway. This episode is going to be a little bit different. The Finswick community recently was shaken up by a case that came out that involves pumping and dumping. And we wanted to make sure that we address the situation. But more importantly, we want to take this as an opportunity to educate the community because we don't want to see this happen again. And we want to really ensure that everybody understands what was taking place, understands why it was wrong, and understands that this type of stuff just can't happen um, moving forward. Uh, So Noah and I felt, you know, given that we have this platform, given that we have TCP, it was our responsibility to come out and talk about it. But we want to bring you guys the facts, right? Exactly. Yeah. And to be honest, I think there's no better way to do that than um, having somebody who's well versed in the legality of the situation come on and really share with us using his knowledge and experience sort of what went down and um, how things like this can be avoided in the future. So, you know, this is going to be, especially for me, a really educational podcast and just learning about the situation from um, somebody who has the experience to really, you know, dissect and dive deep. Um, And so, yeah, I'm excited to get uh, underway here. Exactly. So as Noah mentioned, we have somebody with experience, understands the situation better than we do, which is why we brought him on the podcast, Damon Wright. Damon, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Pleasure to have you. So Damon, if you want to start off by just giving us a little bit of your background, um, so the listeners understand exactly who you are. Sure, sure. So I'm the head of the advertising and e-commerce practice group at the law firm of Gordon Reese. And uh, we're a firm of about 1,200 lawyers with offices in every single state. And we represent um, all variety of businesses. Uh, My focus is largely representing businesses that are selling products and delivering information online. Uh, So a lot of financial publishers and as well, um, a lot of people who've made a lot of money making claims on the internet about how to make money, which is kind of one of the subjects we've got here today. Absolutely. That's the main thing, right? So. We've talked in the past um, off the podcast about the sort of manipulation that takes place. Some of it is a bit more obvious um, than other cases. We'll talk about this specific case, of course. You reading through uh, the document and reading through the case, if you could just quickly explain what sort of manipulation was taking place and why they ended up getting in trouble here. Sure. So just to take a step back... I think for for quite a while, uh, and maybe even at this very moment, people have thought the internet is the wild, wild west. Uh, First Amendment applies. uh, It's oftentimes anonymous speech. I can say whatever I want, regardless of whether it's true or not, because it's the internet and it's free speech. And just let me say it. And uh, if people are gullible enough to believe it, well, then that's uh, that's on them. I'm going to do what I want to do. The law doesn't really see it that way. And this is an example of that. Um, you know, obviously right now, the defendants in the Atlas case are presumed to be innocent. And I want to make clear that, that I don't think anyone on this podcast is prejudging the facts, but we'll focus on what the allegations are that the SEC has made. And the indictment is pretty detailed. Um, Essentially, what the indictment is about is a pump and dump, market manipulation, telling uh, hundreds of thousands of followers that I'm going to go long on this stock. I'm bullish on it. Uh, it's uh, It looks like a sure thing. Ride with me. We're going to make a lot of money. And then once people start to follow that, that uh, the messaging, quietly selling and... Um, that happened uh, according to the SEC again and again and again. So they say in the indictment, defendants engaged in a long running fraudulent scheme to manipulate securities by publishing false and misleading information in online stock trading forums. They engaged in a pattern of contact, a conduct referred to as scalping, in which they recommended the purchase of a particular stock without their disclosing their intent to sell that stock. And I think it was a situation where uh, between the defendants, Edward Constantine, Perry Matlock, Thomas Cooperman, Gary Deal, Mitchell Hennessy, Stephen Harabin, Daniel Knight, and John Rabarzik. 
in a way it was synergistic in that they uh, they each added to each other's credibility so that collectively they appear to be even more credible. Uh, they're all vouching for one another. So the indictment, I, you know, I encourage anyone uh, who is involved with online stock trading forums and, and sort of wanting to see who can they rely on, who can they trust, and which, what are the, some red flags? I, I would say go online, pull up this indictment, and uh, it's an interesting read. It's not just boring legalese. It tells a story, which good lawyers uh, know how to do. So the claims involved are, again, sort of basic pump and dump activity that violate the securities laws. Um, so we've got uh, Section 17A of the Securities Act, and that is uh, makes it a crime to use interstate commerce. That just means basically any communication involving the Internet is going to cross state lines, right? Interstate commerce um, to obtain money or property by means of untrue statements of material facts or omissions of material facts. And, and using the interstate commerce and those communications, whether it's intentionally false with facts or false by omission, to engage in transactions which would operate as a fraud, which would defraud people. Broad statute uh, in connection with the purchase or sale of securities. So that's Section 17A. Then there's violations of Section 10B. Uh, effectively the same thing. Uh, it's it's different, but it's again dealing with fraud in connection with the sale or purchase of securities, and then aiding and abetting, and then a claim for forfeiture, which is uh, the SEC saying we are going to seize all the property that uh, we believe was obtained by virtue of this activity, which is uh, basically means the SEC looks like they're trying to wipe these guys out. So that's a high level overview. Right. I want to go back over some of the facts, um, the alleged facts that the SEC has in this indictment. So if Ryan wants to throw up on the screen and, and you touch on this a little bit, the SEC is alleging that it was a coordinated effort, right? Like it wasn't like um, it was something that was intentionally done as a group to really benefit everybody. Like it was premeditated, right? Like it wasn't something that you know, hey, just because I have a bunch of followers on Twitter and just because I have what I believe to be, um, you know, an important standing in the community, you know, these things are going to happen, right? Like I can't control what happens after I buy a stock and post it, right? I, I can't control what people are going to do. It was more of a concerted effort that they understood that this was going to happen um, and did it anyways, knowing, you know, okay, once I do this, I know that the stock price will go up. I know that I can sell for a profit. I think I'll just speak personally, like from what I understood is that, okay, if you have 100, 200, 300,000 followers on Twitter, yeah, obviously if you post an idea, there's going to be enough volume to sort of move the stock, especially if it's like a low float. Um, and like, what are you supposed to do about that? Not trade, not post your ideas on Twitter. Like that doesn't really seem fair, but it seems like they understood, or at least the SEC is alleging they understood what they were doing before that and use that to their benefit right and i think that that's where you know a line gets crossed in the sec's eyes would that be correct yeah that's right i mean this looks like it was according to the sec very orchestrated you know we saw the same activity three four five years ago with you know every uh, ico right and some new coin that was going to go um triple in value or or you know three hundred thousand percent in value within five days just by people pumping it pump and dump stuff is not new it's been around forever. Um, but yeah, this was a situation where it looks like it was uh, very well orchestrated. Um, the timing, the messaging, uh, talking to one another about this is when I'm going to get in, you get in. And you know, I think what we have here is it's also sometimes a matter of degree. And people have to ask themselves with a, a you know, FinTwick community like this, what's in it for them? They are. They weren't selling um, their alerts. Subscribe to our alerts, so we because you know we're people that like making predictions. We like helping others. Subscribe to our alerts, and and that's how they monetize it. No, they they weren't doing that. It was all free. 
So what's in it for them? What, why are they offering something for free? Are they just really, really generous, thoughtful, kind people? Or is there some way they're trying to make money from this? And now, you know, if the FCC is right, now we know what the answer is. And, the, you know, the same thing with, you know, again, like the crypto stuff from years ago. If someone's saying this is going to go through the roof, are they, is it really just a Ponzi scheme? And, and, they're, and people are riding that wave knowing it's going to crash at some point and hoping they're not going to be the one, the last one to pay top dollar for this. So, yeah, I think it's a matter of degree. They, they obviously had a high profile. It was orchestrated. There were some internal smoking gun, gun type correspondence going on here. And this may be the tip of the iceberg, or it may be the entire iceberg looking at the indictment. Um, you know, we're going to learn more as we watch the case. Sometimes the FTC, not FTC, SEC goes through in very great detail and describes the timeline with some of these trades, but then says, and through all that activity, the defendants made $1,641. <laughs> At other times, they, they, lay it out that timeline kind of way and, and say after all that activity the defendants made you know 743,000 so it's um it's it's gonna be interesting to watch so you said uh high profile and you just mentioned there were some trades where they were making large amounts of money some trades where they were making smaller amounts of money were those large amounts of money that were being made is that really what raised the red flags or is the sec starting to get even more and more serious about this where they're looking to get anybody who's profiting at all by yeah. promoting tweets and selling into tweets. Yeah, I think the SEC is looking to get more involved with this and to take a aggressive, more aggressive stance. I think they should have done it a while ago, honestly, um, because there is, as you said at the beginning, a lot of people, I think, just didn't know. Um, again, thinking Wild Wild West, First Amendment, this is just speech. And you know, I think the, the SEC is trying to catch up and one way to catch up is to do something really splashy, take some people down that sends this message, this ripple effect. The FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, is not involved in this case, but they, for the last three years, have uh, kind of in a related way been very, very aggressive, um, going after businesses that are promising money-making opportunities, um, sort of get-rich-quick type stuff. And, and businesses that are doing it in similar ways as, as these guys. And what I mean by that is saying, look at my lifestyle. Look at this jet. Look at this car. Um, look where I'm traveling. Don't you want to be like me? Well, you can take this course or uh, learn to be an affiliate marketer, learn to sell products on Amazon, uh, or um, learn to be a day trader, or even multi-level marketing. Uh, those kinds of money-making opportunities the FTC has come really hard at businesses and individuals who are making types of these claims about how people can make money. And uh, both in terms of talking about how much these people have made in the past and cherry picking the past. Um, and then, of course, talking about how much people can make in the future. So it's I, I think we're going to see more and more policing of the Internet and money making claims and kind of guru lifestyle type stuff. But it's so, um, I mean, between all the different social media platforms, you know, Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, keep going, um, it's rampant. So it's hard for agencies to keep up. Right. I, I want to stick on this point um, for a little bit longer because this is something that we see all the time on on Twitter. This This part in particular where, you know, it's a, Look, not only am I, you know, making money, you know, doing whatever I, I say that I'm doing. It's also like, hey, look at my McLaren. Hey, look at my Ferrari. Look at my Lamborghini. Don't you want these things? I can you go a little bit deeper? Because I know that we had a conversation, you know, last week about exactly why this is viewed as harmful in the eyes of the FTC in particular. Um, and I guess I just want to share that knowledge with everybody else, because people who weren't involved in this indictment you know, are doing things like this all the time and may not understand why it's wrong and why the FTC may look at something like that and say, hey, you know, you shouldn't be doing that, um, especially if this is how you're going to be making your money selling a certain type of course, service, whatever it is, you shouldn't be 
posting your Lamborghini every day, posting your McLaren every day. Hey, look at me. Look how much money I made. Look at how it changed my life. It can change yours too, as long as you pay $100 a month for my service. Um, talk about why the FTC sort of looks at that in a negative light. Um, back in December of 2020, the FTC announced something called Operation Income Illusion. It sounds like a made like a title of a Bond movie or something. But um, they said, we're going to come after companies that are making earnings claims. And we recognize there are some earnings claims that are fine because they have substantiation. There's a reasonable basis. There's evidence to support the claim. There are other earnings claims that are deceptive because they're misleading, because there isn't a reasonable basis that's not substantiated. So let's like flip it a little bit. If Steph Curry says he's going to go out and score, say he's not injured, if he's going to go out and score 30 points tomorrow night, and he says, and I've consistently scored you know, 25, 30 points for the last several years, that's a defensible claim because he's done it. Uh, he's got that track record. Um, if I say I'm going to do that in an NBA game, that's deceptive. It's totally false. And so you have flip that to, all right, what about someone who says, follow me if you want to learn how to make money? Uh, I am going to make $30 million for my followers tomorrow, next week, next month. And I've been doing it time and time and time again. Probably is deceptive because very, very few people can make that claim and have a, a track record behind it. Um, but some people maybe. And so you have to look to what is the backup? What's the basis for the claim? Is it substantiated? And those numbers were kind of out of whack, maybe too high, but but it comes up in the context of gurus making stock picks. That's maybe the, the best example here. Um, if I work for a financial publisher, I'm a guru, and I have a track record where my product has had, say, 250 alerts over the last two years, and the win rate is 61%, and the average return is, say, 12% across winners and losers. That would be what's typical. And I can talk about that and be proud of that because those are pretty good numbers, right? If I say my win rate is 80% and my average return is 65%, I'm going to get in trouble. And, and what the FTC wants to see now, when, when it's someone who is involved with making money, what they want to see is not the cars and the mansions and the jets and not the cherry pick trade alerts that i pick tesla and i pick zoom look how brilliant i am or even the cherry pick testimonials this guru helped make me five thousand dollars in three weeks what they wanted to want to see and they expect to see is a disclosure of what is typical what's the track record and that can really be tough when the market's down and there are people out there who are making these crazy claims and you're trying to compete as a financial publisher, but that's what they want to see. So it would be the, the win rate, the average return over a, tough, a defined period of time. Um, and, and as close to the present as, as practical. Um, you know, with a lot of courses, this can be tough because we all know that if it's a course, most people aren't going to complete it. They're not going to have that work ethic, that commitment, the drive, the follow through. Um, so maybe you work with that disclosure to, to qualify it. Among people who completed the course and then committed 100 hours to implementing what they learned, here is the track record. But there needs to be a disclosure rather than just assuming, okay, I really did pick Tesla. I really did pick this, you know, the, under the radar commodity stock that no one else knew about that went through the roof. You can do some of that, but it's got to be in conjunction with identifying what is the typical experience. And, uh, and that's what's getting a lot of businesses in trouble right now with the FTC. Um, it's not enough to simply say, oh, this is true. It's got to be also, is it typical? The FTC's focus is that if you make these claims, people are going to think, oh, that's going to happen to me. I'm going to have that same kind of success. And so you got to disclose what's typical. The part that you just mentioned right there, with the truthfulness, because I think that's how most people that intuitively makes sense, right? If I'm saying something, as long as it's not 
false as right. long as it's not a lie, I should be okay. And I think you gave us a really good example with the lottery um, when we spoke last week, where it's like you can say something that technically is true, but if it's misleading, that can trip you up. That's exactly right. Yeah. For a long time, copywriters have thought, okay, if it's true, it's okay. And have used wiggle words such as you could make, uh, you have an opportunity or a potential or possibly or up to and thinking, okay, now I've tweaked this language and it's not a guarantee. It's not absolute. It's possible could. And that's not true. And I'm okay. The FTC's view and really the Sometimes they overreach for sure, but really the approach under advertising law generally is it's not whether something is literally true. It's got to be true to, to pass muster, but it's also, is it misleading? So something, a claim must be true and not misleading. And so I, the example I gave the other day was I could say, hey, I could make a billion dollars tomorrow. I feel really excited about the opportunity to make a billion dollars tomorrow. And can you just imagine how much uh, things would change if I made a billion dollars and you went for that ride with me? And I'm going to give you the opportunity right now, because I like you a lot, to pay me $100,000. And if I make a billion, if and when I make a billion, I'll give you a million dollars out of that. Are you in? And I could make that in my mind. I could probably think to myself, oh, that's all true, because I could buy that winning lottery ticket where the jackpot's a billion dollars. And I do plan on buying that ticket. Uh, and, and if I make a billion dollars, well, that's what I'm going to do. But the reality is I've got about a one in a billion chance of winning that billion dollars. So it's deceptive. Um, again, back to my example of Steph Curry, right? Um, so the reasonable basis for the claim and the substantiation is always the important thing. Um, it, in the words could possible potential opportunity uh, that they're not going to fix copy that creates a, a false misleading net impression. And at the same time, you could have two people, not a billion dollars, but two people making the exact same claim. And for one person, it would be deceptive because they don't have the track record for another person. It won't be deceptive because they do have the track record. And so that's really important to keep in mind as you're, as you're working through this. Um, I know, you know, in getting to know you both in your company, you've done some really good things. You're being very transparent. Um, you're building a brand that's not sort of a get rich quick look at us. We're ballers uh, kind of um, theme, but it's a uh, we work hard and we uh, do our diligence and we're thoughtful and we care about people and we've made money. We've lost money. Um, we're learning all the time. You know, I, I think. Hopefully, that's going to be attractive to people. I think it is attractive to the right type of, of person. Yeah, Damon, I, I really appreciate you um, saying that. That means a lot. And I want to emphasize how awesome it is to hear you put everything into legal terms. But a lot of what you just said and explained is what Noah and I talk about all the time on the podcast. And for us, it's kind of common sense. When you win trades, show people you're winning. When you lose trades, show people you're losing. But now when we think about it in terms of how, that, how the FTC views it, it's illegal. And we see it every day on FinTwit. Twitter is flooded with everybody trying to show everybody how much money they're making and how well they're doing in the market and how good they are at trading. And for us, it was always this idea of we want people to understand the trading is very, very difficult. And you'll never, ever hear us say, come trade with us. You'll make all this money. Oh, I made you know $100,000 in a month. I learned how to trade in only three months. So, like Some of these ridiculous claims that you see, Noah and I have used our platform on the podcast to make sure that we get the point across to people, hey, there's, of course, a ton of opportunity in the market. You, yes, you can become wealthy trading. But it's very, very difficult and it requires a ton of work. And as you mentioned, like our whole message is if you're willing to put in that work and you're willing to learn, we'd love to work with you. But what we see more often than not is come follow my trades because I'm so good at this that you're going to start making the same amount of money that I make. And you see people who 
it almost seems like they never lose. And when we were first starting to trade, when I first came to Twitter, I would see these guys, the guys named in this document who were making millions of dollars. And to me, that was so discouraging because I was like, how on earth could I ever get to that level? Here we are, you know, years later, we come to find out that obviously what they were doing was illegal, but there's still a lot of this going on. So they got yeah. caught. Yeah. There are still so many people who are doing something similar, who have been doing something similar, whether it's pumping and dumping penny stocks, whether it's pumping and dumping um, options contracts, whether it's simply being deceptive, as you mentioned before, telling people, this is how much money I make. We see a lot of paper trading, which we talk about on the podcast. No, we've never, we've never talked about it in legal terms. We've never come on the podcast and said, oh, paper trading can actually put you in jail. This is going to wake a lot of people up because it did, you know, it still feels like just Twitter for the longest time. It just felt like Twitter is like, oh, you know, somebody's paper trading. Oh, well, they're a bad person selling a service like they shouldn't have done that. Right. Like that's a scummy thing to do. That's illegal. They can get in trouble. And so hopefully yeah. this really sets the tone now and we completely cut that out. And that's going to, you know, that's where. I'm excited now for what Fintwit can become because I think that people are going to realize what trading really is. And, you know, the, the scammers and the market manipulation, that's been around well before Twitter was even invented. So that's never going to go away. But hopefully it cleans things up a little bit. Hey, Noah, what do moving averages, RSI and MACD all have in common? They're all lagging indicators from the 70s with weak ability to predict future price action. Exactly. Modern retail traders need modern trading tools. That's why we've partnered with Rocket Scooter, an artificial intelligence and algorithmic charting tool that predicts where high volume will occur before it happens. That's right. Rocket Scooter's 15 unique indicators help visualize in real time where institutional players are interested on almost any stock and gives you a clear-cut game plan for how to take advantage of the underlying mechanics of the market. A platform like that probably costs a ton of money. Well, for seven days, Rocket Scooter will offer their groundbreaking technology completely free. Then, once you decide you're ready to become part of the Rocket Scooter community, for a limited time only, Rocket Scooter is offering 50% off their monthly subscription for life, as long as your membership stays active. Use the link in the show notes to get started using Rocket Scooter for half price today. Could you possibly just cover really quickly paper trading in and of itself? Because like that specific subset, I think, is, um, like Alejandro said, an area that we haven't really covered. And that is more so, I think, Outside of like the low float penny stocks, I think if you if you've been trading long enough, you start to realize, OK, these low float stocks are at risk of being pump and dumped. Right. So maybe let me avoid those. Let me trade um, options. Or let me trade futures or whatever. And you find somebody on Twitter who says they made five million dollars last year trading futures, trading options. And in reality, they were trading um, on paper. So a, a fake account, not real money. They have fake gains, not real gains. They didn't actually make five million dollars in their in their virtual account. They did with fake money, with with fake risk, but in real life, they didn't do that. Can you explicitly talk about why doing that and then saying, "Hey, I made five million dollars last year. Come see how I did it." If you buy the seventy dollar course, why explicitly is that illegal? I mean, there's nothing wrong with paper trading if you just want to teach yourself, learn, and without the risk, right? Um, right. Uh, I can play chess against the computer or I can play with other people um, and uh, keep score and get you know, my ranking, whatever. But uh, it goes back to the quality of the substantiation and the reasonable basis for a claim. And very similar is backtesting uh, with financial publishers saying we have a product and here's the, here's the historical performance of this product and the alerts of this product, but it's based on backtested data. There's going to be many times thumb on the scale kind of, um, methodology involved with that. If I say five years ago, if I said, I've got a great strategy for predicting who's going to win the Super Bowl. If your quarterback has the initials TB, I think that, you know, you're, you're likely to win the Super Bowl. It's not, um, it's not the same kind of evidence and substantiation. So if, if there's a financial publisher saying, 
this is what my product has done. This is the alerts. Uh, or it, just some guru who's trying to build a following, they really need to disclose whether these are actual trades with real money that really happened and they've got the backup for that, or it was play money or it was back tested. Uh, you've got to disclose that. Otherwise, it's going to be considered to be a deceptive claim. Perfect. Thank you. We talked about all the things that the Atlas Discord group did wrong. Um, but now I want to focus on moving forward how members of the FinTwit community can avoid groups like these moving forward. And a lot of it is finding trusted groups of individuals who you feel are being honest, who you feel are not being deceptive. I do want to pull up a quote from the document, Ryan, if you don't mind putting that on the screen here. So this was a conversation that the Atlas group was having inside of their Discord. And Knight says, get caught, question mark, we're robbing effing idiots of their money. Cooperman, it's so funny because I can see the, I can like see the timeline of these. Like I get it. I send it to Dan. I know Dan's on voice. Dan tells you guys, I see it go up more. Then I send it to Gary and I see it go up like way more laughter. My other thing is too, it's like, all right, if we lose on one of these, we've won on like a hundred. So we got to remember with these ultra ones, they all do the same thing. It like spikes, comes down for a second. Then the scalpers get out, like Gary gets out then. Then Cooperman goes on to say, and then it goes effing buku. But no, that's not only it. Like what he does, he's, he alerts it. And then like five minutes later, all his little minions start like retweeting it and saying added with him. So it like builds the hype back up. It happens every single time they have their shit down to an effing science. It's crazy. So the reason that we wanted to read this on the podcast is because I think that it says a lot about the type of people that actually got in trouble here. So they knew very well uh, what was taking place was illegal. And they knew very well that they were taking advantage of their follower base. And again, I said it at the beginning of the podcast, I want this episode to be a way and that we educate the community because I don't want to see people fall into these similar traps. And we've done a really good job, I think, so far in the episode explaining um, the techniques that they were using in order to not only manipulate the stock price, but to grow these large followings, convincing people that they were living these luxurious lifestyles and that you could be me if you just buy the stock that I'm recommending. But Damon, I want to ask you, and after reading that, when looking for a group that you want to trade with, whether it's options, penny stocks, long-term investing, what are some serious major red flags so that you don't fall into this same sort of trap? Because again, we read that and you realize these people knew exactly what they were doing. They had poor intentions, but we couldn't see that. We couldn't see that. Their tweets, you know, they were extremely popular guys. Everybody on FinTwit loved them, literally loved them because they were making so much money. And you just think, oh man, like these guys are, these guys are awesome. They're trying to help the community. Look at them giving out free alerts. It's the best thing on the planet. So knowing now that a lot of that was obviously a facade, how can members of the FinTwit community avoid groups like those moving forward? Yeah, let me, let me ask you a, a question answer a question with a question. Um, do, sure. you, do you think the community um, thought that these guys were really just being very generous and, you know, they weren't charging. They just thought they were being selfless, generous, thoughtful, kind. Or did some people know that they were, there was a wave that was going to be created and we were going to ride that wave with them. They're probably doing something a little bit shady, but maybe I'll short the stock uh, once, you know, a couple of weeks after they say buy it, you know, what do you think was the mentality? Maybe it's different for different people. I think it was the latter for most. You never really saw it. And I'll speak from personal experience. I never understood the back end where they tweet something, they sell it literally seconds later. I saw it as they tweet something. I know 
that that stock is going to get volume. If I wanted to trade alongside with them, I could potentially make some money if I do it the right way. I think a lot of people had that same mentality. And so what they were doing was not necessarily seen as harmful because, again, I couldn't see what was really going on below the surface. All I saw was the price of a stock that they recommended going up. But then at the same time, I was asking myself, how come I'm not making as much money as they are? Right. Because to me, the stock goes up 10, 15, 20%, 50% in a day. Yeah. And then if I didn't do as well as I would have liked to, I'm thinking to myself, you got these guys who just made $2 million in a day. I couldn't even make $1,000. I must be bad at trading, right? When actually they weren't trading, they were pumping and dumping, which we come to find out. So I think I like you kind of knew there was some sort of malicious intent. I always like to think also, it was a free discord. Okay. So who's the product? It's obviously the members of the discord that are the product, right? And so they were using that to their advantage. So you knew something was up, but you didn't know the extent of it. Right. And it was, I mean, again, we, we talked to these guys, we spoke to them, um, whether it was tweets. Um, we had Hugh on the podcast and had a very genuine conversation with him. And now I look back at that and I'm like, geez, I mean, <laughs> like he's, you know, I don't, I don't know how to feel about it quite honestly, but I think everybody was under the same spell. Yeah. Yeah. And if, if, if the tweets had said, I like this stock, I think this stock's going to go up, but I might sell at any time. You know, if it hits, if it goes up a dollar, I could sell everything. I'm not, it's this, I'm going long. I'm in that, that sort of stuff. That's where you have the deliberate deception. Um, well, let me answer your question about red flags. So I think one red flag could be the, the guru who's giving all this away for free. The product is the people, the people of the product, as you said, I think, and that's, I'm not trying to paint with a broad brush. There are, I'm absolutely certain there are people who are giving away information for free who aren't pumping and dumping, but that could be a red flag. How are they monetizing this? Another red flag though, could be the person who, or the company that's um, charging for their alerts and at the same time uh, making such crazy earnings claims or deceptive earnings claims that you have to say to yourself, okay, if they are making you know, a million dollars a day and you can change the numbers up to, to $100,000 a day, whatever, if they're making this kind of money, why are they wasting their time trying to sign me up for a course that is $115 a month? I mean, well, you know, it's one of the, I've got three kids now who are smarter than me. Um, 22 year old daughter, 20 year old son, 17 year old son. I remember talking to one of my kids about this, you know, when they were like eight or nine, I'm like said, dad, uh, why is this guru? How is this guru able to um, keep anyone employed at his company? I mean, I would think that if all the claims he's making are true, his assistant would have quit her job uh, weeks ago because she could become a multimillionaire in just a few months. Uh, you know, right? You know, if you think of you know some of these big sort of rock style um, you know, performances with some gurus who are you know just talking about you know ten x this and all that. Yeah, do they have anybody working for them? Or is everyone quit because they are exposed to this and they just immediately are able to make infinitely more money, um, you know, including, you know, the people who does, the, does the, the lighting and the audio for this performance, right? It's, it's so easy to become a millionaire. Why is anyone doing this? So that's a red flag, right? It's almost you really need to find someone who's charging for their, for their content but not making ridiculous claims and has that back up, the substantiation um, disclosed in a conspicuous way. So free or really ridiculous claims, stay away from that, or at least go in with uh, eyes wide open, kick the tires. Right. I, I want to reiterate what you said, because we know of people who give out information for free. And at least, you know, as far as I'm aware, don't sell on their followers and stuff like that. So I don't want to, you know, completely discredit anybody right. who gives out things for free. And, and right. Damon made a good point, right? Is that it's not going to be every, it's not like, oh, this is free, immediate red flag. Just look into it a little deeper. Why is it why is it free? And so 
another point that I wanted to bring up, um, put it back to like how people were viewing this, I guess, before everything came out, and I'll speak from personal experience as well, is like, especially during this time, like we have to remember how the market was, right? Like this was, they really blew up like early 2021 when the market was going crazy, right? That was when Tesla had the crazy run, um, ARC, the ETF had a crazy run. So like the market was doing crazy things, right? So it wasn't like, when you would see a small cap go 50, 100% in a day, it wasn't like something unusual. Like this was kind of happening every day. And so from my viewpoint, I was seeing these things happen every day. And then I also saw that they were kind of in like most of the ones that went pretty crazy, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, these things are happening whether Atlas is calling them or not. Stocks are going 100% every day. How are they always in the ones that do that, right? Like that's that was my mindset. And what they would talk about a lot in the Discord and on Twitter was you have to do your due diligence, right? You have to go do your homework. You have to go research the stocks. You have to go and put in the work to find those opportunities. And if you lose, what I would hear a lot of the times is you didn't do enough due diligence, right? You didn't know that this company, oh, this company had an offering and now the stock's down 60%. You didn't do your due your due diligence. That's on you. That sort of was their angle was like, it's a lot of work to be successful in the stock market. Come join our discord. Cause we're going to do that work for you. And then you can use the work that we do to ultimately become successful. And I bought it personally. I was like, that makes sense. These things are running anyways. They mm-hmm. happen to be in the ones that run. It's because they do all the homework when right. in reality they're running in large part because they're calling it out because they have such a large audience. And so for me, it was like, I don't know about your long-term track record. I see that, you know, one of the things that they would do is they would buy a stock, for example, at $2, say the stock's going to 15. I would watch that and it wouldn't always make it to 15, but usually it would go to like three or four or something like that. And so I was like, that's an opportunity, right? Even if this stock isn't necessarily going to go to 15, it at least should get a short-term bounce. Let me see if I can take advantage of that as opposed to wait a minute, why does it never really go to that price target, right? Like, why does it never really have any follow through? Why does it constantly get this short term bump? And then it always winds up reversing. And when it reverses, it's pretty ugly, right? That was, it was almost like a game of, it was almost like a game of musical chairs. And I think for most people, that's how it felt was like, look, I don't, I don't even care if the, and I think that was obviously part of it was like, in your head, it's like, well, this is going to go to 15. He says, even if it doesn't, even if it goes to like six or seven, I'll make a lot of money. So let me try and jump in on that first initial ride to like six or seven, and then I'll get out. If it goes to 15, great. Right. And I I think that pattern of having it repeat over and over again was something that for me at 20 years old, I wasn't really like putting the pieces together. And I think obviously that's where we need, you know, enforcement like the SEC, the FTC to come in and say, here's why that's not happening. Here's why none of these ever go to 50. And here's why they always reverse a couple of days later. Um, And it's not that you didn't do your due diligence, right? It has nothing to do with that. Um, So I think that was part of like the smoke and mirrors that, you know, even for people, especially for people, I should say that, that were just getting started and were a little bit newer in the market. It's very easy to like fall for something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the takeaway from this case it doesn't have to be that people should be afraid to express their opinion about uh, what stocks are going to go up, what stocks are going to go down. Uh, but it's you, you can't make misstatements of material fact. You can't say you're going, you're holding this long, and you're in for the ride until it hits this amount of money when you've done just the opposite. That's false and fraudulent. You can you can have opinions about how this is a great sector, or this is a great stock. You're you're excited about this. And um, as a as a financial publisher, you can make predictions too. Uh, that's what people are paying you for. They want your experience, your knowledge. It doesn't mean that if your predictions didn't come to be true, that you've deceived anyone. It means that you're in the business of predicting things, and no one's got a crystal ball. And one thing that's not to get off too off point, but there is in the financial publishing realm, there is your marketing, your ad copy and sort of what attracts people to you to then want to pay you. And that's called commercial speech, and it receives less protection of the First Amendment. 
You've got to be more guarded and not make these earnings claims that are deceptive, as we talked about. And then once people are, are actually subscribing and paying you and you're making predictions, that's non-commercial speech. That has the highest First Amendment protection. So you might say, I think that Apple is going to double next year. And it's not a deceptive earnings claim. It's a prediction about what you think is going to happen based on your, your data, your diligence. Um, if you said in the ad copy, though, you said, subscribe with me because I'm going to make a recommendation that's going to cause your investment portfolio to double, that'd be a problem. So you, this is a First Amendment lesson a little bit, but there's a difference between what the protection is for speech depending on what the context is. It's um, And that all can get blurred for sure, depending on the nature of the speech. Yeah, but yeah, absolutely. That, you know, the regulators, the internet's been here for a while now, but regulators are still trying to catch up. And pump and dump schemes have been around for decades and decades and decades, but it's almost like... Um, you know, with the with the internet, with Robinhood, Rise of the Retail Investor, and um, all these other social media platforms, it's just overwhelming. I mean, it's just so many ways to just like so many ways to get your music out there, right? If you're an artist, there's so many ways to to pull scams because of the internet too. So it's a lot. Yeah, and the only thing that we didn't really talk about because no one I gave our own personal experience is when we try to trade some of these stocks, a lot of people, the majority of people, I would assume, lost money because of what they were doing. That's like the big thing here, right? That they made it seem as though they were making so much money and they were illegally. But on the back end of that are quite literally hundreds of thousands of people who lost money trying to trade these stocks alongside with this group. Yeah. And that's the most unfortunate part because it's the pump and then the dump. And if you don't know what the, what you're doing, and that was their target group, as we just read from uh, the document where they were uh, joking and laughing about how everybody was an idiot. Ryan pulled it up here again. Get caught. We're robbing effing idiots of their money. That was their target group. People who don't know how to trade. People who are looking to make a quick buck. Because they knew those are the type of people who they could get in on the pump. And then when they made their money and they were happy with their gains, we're going to be left holding that bag on the other side when the stock goes down. And if you look at all these stocks that they were trading, obviously, if you look now, I mean, these stocks are destroyed. But even two weeks after the scheme was over, the stocks are down 60%, 70%, 80%. And you have to imagine that People who don't know what they're doing are just left there still with the idea in their mind that, well, this person said it was going to 10 bucks. So I'm just going to hold because it's got to come back up. Right. And that at the end of the day was the part that was most disgusting because, again, they knew exactly what they were doing. They knew that was taking place and they didn't care. And they made a lot of money off of people. Yeah, it's it's, it's really sad. I mean, there, there, there are people who are. You know, Busting their butts, waiting tables, right. washing dishes, doing construction, or or whatever they're doing, but they're thinking, okay, this is the way for me to improve the quality of my life, to take care of my kids, take care of my mom, my dad, to be able, we, all these aspirations, and um, yeah, according to the SEC's allegations, they were viewed as suckers. All right, Damon, well. This was an awesome um, episode. And again, thank you so much for coming on. I think that this was really the right way to do things. We wanted to make sure that we talked about the subject and having you to uh, really clear things up you know, made for an awesome episode here. So thank you so I much. I think that our listeners are going to take a ton, a ton of value from this. So thank you. Great. Great. My pleasure. All right. Now, another awesome episode. I'll see you next week for episode 59. Yep. Take care, guys.